So it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Barrett Caldwell, who's the interim head for industrial engineering, to introduce our next associate professor. Barrett? And so the next associate professor is actually on this slide. Can you find him? <laughs> oh, no, too late. Okay. Yeah, it's quite all right. Um, I'm supposed to uh, do this as a tag team with John Sutherland, the head of uh, Triple E, um, he'll be here. and he'll be here real soon, I promise. Um, I also run into the problem that if I took the time to do a full introduction of Dr. Kai, I would, she would run out of time to actually present. So I, I'm going to try to go through this fairly quickly and not talk about all the wonderful things that you've been doing. So. Professor Wakai is an associate professor at Purdue University with a joint appointment in the School of Industrial Engineering and Environmental and Ecological Engineering. She received her PhD from the University of Michigan in 2015, and her research focuses on systematically evaluating the environmental impacts of engineering technologies. She's won a number of national and international academic awards including the prestigious NSF Career Award. And her research is also making policy, industry, and society impacts informing the decisions of the city of Chicago, the Indiana Department of Transportation, Ford Motor Company, and the New York State Energy and Research, uh, sorry, Energy Research and Development Authority to help develop more sustainable shared transportation systems. You're now seeing what I mean about doing all of this. She collaborates across disciplines, as, as we just saw, in including helping food scientists and nutritionists to build models to study the net life cycle environmental impacts of emerging food technologies, such as nano packaging and nutrition enhanced eggs. She is working on projects under development by the United Nations Environment Program. And she is co-chair of the Sustainable Urban System Section for the International Society of Industrial Ecology and the associate editor of the journal for the Journal of Cleaner Production and a guest editor for Transportation Research, Part D, Transport and Environment. And we were just talking recently about this wonderful idea that she has for updating uh, engineering economics education. So I'm only confused about when you actually go home and sleep. <laughs> so uh, at this point, I will introduce Professor Waka. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barrett. Um, Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm very humbled to be here today and share with you a little bit about my journey to Purdue and also uh, what we do at my research uh, uh, group. So uh, I was born in Kunming, Yunnan province in China, which is southwestern uh, city in China. It's high plateau area, elevation about 6,000 uh, feet. And we have an inland lake, you can see, where we actually have a seagull this time of the year coming from Siberia to spend the winter there every year. Now, that's also the lake when I was four. My dad was trying to teach me swimming, and I almost got carried away by the waves, but that's a different story. So that lake, um, when during the time I grew up, from to time to time, you will see the lake in this color. That's the algae boom from all the pollutions with the industrialization of the cities caused all the pollutions. So that's actually the start of how I got interested in environmental problems and why I studied uh, environmental engineering um, in Tsinghua University in Beijing and then at Penn State um, and then uh, work as an uh, environmental engineer and lab manager for remediation technology in Seattle uh, for about four years. So up to that point, my career goal was to be an environmental engineer, master all the um, best technologies to solve the, uh, to solve the problems other engineering uh, created uh, for the environment. But during the process, I, I learned three things that actually changed my career path. 
So number one is technology is very important, but that's not the only part that matters to solve a problem. And number two is when I do more and more projects, I realize to fix the problem after it has happened is too late. We pollute a site in a couple days, month, but when we design the system to clean it up, we're designing a system that will be operating for 30, 50, 100 years. So is there anything we can do better ahead of time um, to, to avoid having those problems so we don't have to fix them afterwards? So that's the time when I got interested in system engineering, prospective modeling, complex system, et cetera. So I started to read and learn about those things. And number three, uh, was during the time I was doing my master's and during uh, my work at the R&D internal lab, I realized doing research is a such fun thing. But at that time, I only have the opportunity to implement other people's idea and I want to generate my own idea and do uh, research to test my idea. So those three things combined together uh, is what drive me to um, get my PhD at Michigan. Um, I want to study sustainable uh, system modeling. Um, so I actually customized my PhD. So my co-advisor, Peter Agents and Ming Xu was very supportive for me to customize my PhD, doing a joint degree from two departments in environmental engineering and also a School of Natural Resource and Environment. And I also got two graduate certificates, one in uh, complex system, one in science, uh, technology and public policy, so I have the knowledge to do the research I really want to do. So one thing I learned during um, my, my, my time in the US and in my PhD is, you don't have to order from the menu. Um, if you have a vision, and there's a lot of resources that you can find to support to achieve what you really want to do. So, and then in 2015, um, I joined Purdue. And my research focus nowadays is on the um, urban sustainability of using prospective modeling. So right now, about uh, over half of the population already live in urban area. And to support those, all those people, we need the resources and the, the resource uh, consumption needs uh, bring challenges and also opportunities uh, to serve all the needs. And this urbanization trend is going to continue. And by 2050, we expect to have almost 70% of the global population live in urban areas. So we need to ensure that we stay on a sustainable development path. And to do that, and also as the society develop, there will be new technology, new system developing. So when we have a new system, we are in the earlier adoption phase, there's a lot of options, um, very little data on what's gonna happen, what works, um, but there's a lot of choices we can do to change the system. As we gradually um, adopt into a system, and when we have more and more um, infrastructure built, um, very expensive infrastructure built to support those systems, we're gradually locked in. We're going to have a lot of data, but by then there's very little flexibility in terms of what we can do to change the impacts. So my focus is when we are in the earlier phase one, how can we build models to identify what's gonna happen in different scenarios so we can inform the system development so we make better decisions now to avoid negative unintended consequences later on. And specifically, uh, the uh, sectors that I have been fo uh, focusing on is the transportation sector because it consumes about 90% of the gasoline and generate about a quarter, uh, a third of the emissions um, globally and also in the US. And in transportation, there are three trends that are changing the system. That's shared mobility, uh, autonomous driving, and electrification. So we have the opportunity to decide what do we do today in terms of utilizing these opportunities and technologies and what kind of uh, uh, future transportation system do we build. Depending on what system we support and uh, design and use, right, they could bring a utopia um, sustainable transportation system or they could bring a dystopia system. Right? A lot of that lies in uh, what do we know today and what do we do today. Okay. 
So when we look at the environmental impacts of a system, uh, we cannot only look at the parts that we're using the system. We need to look at uh, uh, a life cycle perspective, looking at how what the, the car is made of, right? what's the process of making the fuel. Right? That life cycle um, impacts is the impact of a, a vehicle. And when we electrify a vehicle, we also need to think about where the electricity coming from, not because they don't have tailpipe emission, um, they're clean. Right? Uh, we also need to think about what additional changes we, we need to make, for example, batteries. And this is more of a traditional life cycle of an electric vehicle. But there's still something missing. right? That's the human being part, how we drive. And where do we travel from? Where, uh, when do we stop? Where do we have charging opportunities? Will also influence how we use the vehicles, uh, what the electricity we're using is from, and that will contribute to the impacts as well. So we were among the first to use large-scale mobility data captured from uh, our vehicle GPS to try to understand the travel pattern and how they will impact the environmental impacts of uh, electric vehicles. So on the shared mobility side, about 2017, 2018, a lot of the shared uh, bikes, shared e-scooters just appeared in cities. And the cities don't know, okay, are, are they sustainable, right? But if we take a life cycle perspective, um, they are not necessarily um, emission free because you, it takes energy and material to make them. It also requires rebalancing, which are using uh, vehicles to move the bikes and the scooters around. So uh, we build models to uh, establish emission factors for these shared uh, mobility uh, modes to understand how uh, sustainable they are. And also, they don't appear in isolation. They appear uh, as part of the existing system. So we also uh, work with uh, uh, INDOT, Indiana Depor Department of Transportation, trying to understand, are the e-scooters competing or complementing existing bus systems? And also, we build um, collaborating uh, with uh, uh, Nadia Grita from Civil Engineering. We also conduct conducted a survey to understand the travel, uh, travel pattern and the mode choice behavior in Indianapolis, uh, build agent-based models trying to understand if we change the distribution and the pricing of the system, how would the mode choice change in terms of these modes, change vehicle ownership and use. And also, many cities are also wondering how many do we need? How many should we allow? And we also build models trying to uh, inform those decisions as well. And uh, uh, shared Mobility is more than shared micromobility. We also have shared vehicles, shared rides. And the three uh, emerging trends are also not hap happening in isolation. They are happening at the same time, and they may um, prevent or stimulate each other. We may have a electric vehicles first, and then they become shared and autonomous. We may have autonomous vehicle first, and then that will actually promote electric vehicle. So, when we build charging stations, we also need to consider all these uh, changes that's happening in parallel, and they may have different development pathways. So we build agent-based models trying to understand if we have different development pathways, how would that impact our uh, charging infrastructure needs as well. So. Uh, we do models trying to understand what's the environmental performance of a product or system. But eventually, to really have an impact, as Xiaoshui mentioned, uh, we also need to provide the information to consumers. And that information is normally uh, come in the form of uh, eco-label stickers. Um, so uh, working with uh, human factor uh, experts, Mark Lecto, uh, we use uh, food eco-labels trying to understand how people uh, evaluate product and how much attention they put on the eco-labels um, using eye-tracking glasses in real-world shopping environment. So this is an example of a project that I wouldn't be able to do if not, I'm not uh, housed in industrial engineering and uh, next to the human factor uh, researchers knowing what they're doing. And normally, we, uh, as industrial ecologists, uh, we, we stop at the modeling and the getting the number and we sanctify with that. So uh, very briefly about teaching, I teach both in uh, IE and the triple E. 
And uh, uh, because I'm running short on time, uh, I will skip some of the details. And I also doing some work, as Barrett mentioned, uh, for the New York State Climate Impacts Assessment using the results in my research, trying to inform um, their preparedness for the climate change as well. So I couldn't be here today doing what I'm doing without an uh, incredible supporting system with my formal mentors, informal mentors, and also uh, my collaborators. I learned so much from every single one of you, so I really want to thank you for your support. And also, uh, I couldn't do all those work by myself without my students. So I often ask myself, what did I do um, to be blessed with uh, all these great students to work with me? So every day, they inspire me. So I also want to thank them and also the funding agencies that are supporting my research. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, John. Hi. We have time for questions, I believe. Otherwise, I'm going to pick on somebody. What suggestions do you have for assistant professors to be productive in research among many detracts from other responsibilities? So this is, uh, thank you, John. So th this is a great question, and uh, that's also um, one that I struggled with when I started uh, with. And uh, I got many uh, advices about time management from different people, and the one strategy that I found was really helpful for me is to prioritize what's important. So I uh, identify a task that I think I have to get this done today. This is the most important task. And then I work on that before any other distractions. So I prioritize my research time. And uh, um, that will not come without cost. So that would mean maybe I'm slowing in responding to emails, um, uh, et cetera. But uh, I think you have to prioritize and uh, doing some trade-off here. Good. How about somebody down here? Yeah, you didn't think <laughs> I'd come pick on people. All right. You, Bill. Maybe this is in, in line with opening more collaborations. Have you thought about some of your methods applied to aviation? So both Dr. DeLarentis and I have looked at some environmental impacts of aviation, sustainable aviation, electric air mobility, uh, just curious about what your interest might be in that area. Yeah, air uh, mobility and uh, air taxi, for example, is uh, um, receiving more and more uh, attention. I'm interested, um, so I haven't got the time to do much, but that's definitely an area I'm kind of watching the literature. So if there's interest to collaborate, I would be very happy to talk more about that. Yeah, this was an issue that came up with our friends at Cranfield. Thanks, John. Uh, well, what, what what stands out for me in a lot of the research that you presented is, you know, the, the impact towards, you know, the ultimate beneficiary. How do how do the findings of your research make it to those who take decisions? Right, it's sort of big uh, in what you do. From your, that's not often the case with you know a lot of other faculty that they're not necessarily at you know have to worry a lot about that. What, what resources have you found are available and what resources would you like to see here that help faculty with that transition to having policy impact? So uh, first of all, I, I think um, uh, different research have different nature. Some work is more theoretical and then for them to have the real world impacts that may require some uh, collaboration with more uh, people who do more applied work like me. Um, so that would help. And I think um, we already have a lot of uh, supports on, on campus, um, building connections to talk to INDOT or Ford or um, the, the uh, Center for Environment, for example, building the connections, sharing opportunities to, to identify those opportunities so we can reach out to the stakeholders. Um, so I think, um, uh, 
to know the opportunities and information is the, the, the first step. And then that will lead to uh, opportunities to talk to the decision makers and make the impact. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing this uh, great story. So yeah, I sometimes uh, I drive my car and I hear the radio NPR news talk about her research. So this is kind of very impact, right? So I wonder what you what you uh, do you have any comments about that? Say how did you identify this kind of uh, very impactful uh, research topic? Did you you know uh, read a lot of uh, literature review, find a problem, or did you talk with a lot of people or uh, go to conference and uh, talk with people? Yeah, so do you have any suggestions to find like a very uh, impactful uh, research topic? Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, so when I do the research, I didn't think much about what would happen after that. I can't predict which one will catch more media attention. And that was not part of uh, I was uh, uh, thinking about when we uh, decide which research topic to do. I think um, for research projects, I ident identify a need a gap, and then I pursue that project. Some of the, the questions do come from talking to the stakeholders. Uh, for example, we look at rebalancing because when we talk to the bike share companies, they mention uh, they have that issue. And then uh, that also help us to resh uh, reshape our research questions as well. I think for applied research, talking to the stakeholders is definitely helpful. And then that also combines with the, uh, the research gaps. Uh, nowadays, I didn't get time to mention nowadays when we have more and more uh, large scale high resolution data, sometimes we're limited by our method. So there's also needs to develop better methods so we can fully take advantage of the data we have. And those method development research is also very important, but they, they may not be the, uh, the high impact research that will get more media attention. Well, uh, thank you. This this has been great. I I want to get back to a comment that you made about the opportunity for collaboration and interdisciplinary work. Some of us with a little bit more gray hair um, are used to an academic environment where there's been such an emphasis on independent work and solo work. What do you think is both the challenge but also the advantage of developing these bigger, more interdisciplinary, more um, uh, integrative types of projects and, and for your scholarship and not just the project itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barrett. So, so I think um, the Purdue environment definitely cherishes inter uh, interdisciplinary um, collaboration. Uh, for myself, I feel that um, I still I think there's still a lot of opportunities hasn't been captured. Um, there are colleagues at, that I want to work with, but I don't have the time span where they don't have the time span where we haven't found the correct project to work together. So I feel like that I want to spend more time or more attention spent to further develop these collaboration that could lead to larger projects that's kind of still on my uh, wish list um, that uh, knowing what other people are working on what are the common interests that can help uh, build more of these uh, 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 interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. Does that answer your question? Hello. I've had the pleasure to TA with you. And although you had to briefly skip over it, I'm really interested in hearing how you translate your research, your experiences, your own education into the classroom. And as Dr. Barrett mentioned, like you've got new ideas for engineering economics. I'd just like to hear a little bit about, I guess, your philosophy and pedagogy. So the, 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 the great uh, side of working with great students is they challenge you every day. <laughs> so for teaching and uh, research, so some of the, the teaching is uh, linked to my uh, research. So I also introduce the project. I do the challenges we do uh, to the students in the classroom. So I think 
uh, teaching the students the classical methods and also contemporary issues are both important. So they have the knowledge to uh, work to solve the problem, but also have the context of what's going on in real world and how they can apply those methods to solve those problems is also uh, very important. So I try to combine that and find ways to deliver that information more effectively and also in a fun way. I think learning should be fun. All right, let's thank Professor Sai. Thank you. Thank you.